How a Coal Mine Worker Founded a Billion Dollar Company Expect more, pay less is Target Corporation's motto and they have never failed to deliver the same to their customers. They are America's second largest retail store chain today, gaining its title after running the business for more than a century. They have come a long way to maintaining such a stronghold over the Americans and international casual clothes retail market. But how did they do that? How did Target become internationally known, even in countries they aren't in, for their significantly discounted product range? That's true. Everything on the show is for sale. Well, it all began in the summer of March 6, 1857. A philanthropist was born in Clifton Springs, New York, George Draper Dayton, son of Caroline Wesley and David Day Dayton. Little did his parents know what their child was destined for. His family was one of average means and earned just enough to sustain day-to-day -day needs and wants. We all had dreams of what we would want to become when we grew up, and so did George. He wanted to become a minister, but instead was lured into the business world. Growing up, his life was filled with struggles. As a child, he was an opponent of slavery, whose New York home was a stomp on the Underground Railway for slaves to flee into Canada. His father was a compassionate doctor, a physician in New York State who served the poor for free. His father's generosity couldn't pay for his future, so Dayton set off on his own in 1873 at the mere age of 16 to work in a coal and lumber yard. He was a workaholic and did whatever it took to earn, even if it meant ignoring his health. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't, I don't care. No worries. In 1878, he married a beautiful lady named Emma Chadwick in the Presbyterian Church. I'm sure many of you are wondering why I mentioned the church's name specifically. Later on in the video, you shall see how George's connection with the Presbyterian Church proved to be instrumental to the rise of his Dayton company, presently known as Target Corporation. Most people at his age would dream to open a store in a place like Minnesota, but not George. He wanted a bank. When he came to western Minnesota at the age of 24, George became a banker. In the decades following the Civil War, the Upper Midwest was being settled by a tide of European immigrants, German, Scandinavian, and Irish. It was a hard life, but sufficiently full of promise to attract a group of East Coast real estate investors. Impressed by the business acumen of George, the East Coast real estate investors sent him to Worthington, Minnesota in 1881 to manage their affairs. George did quickly recognize the opportunities his new situation presented, and within two years he purchased a bank and moved his wife Emma and their young children to Worthington. George prospered and became a pillar of the community, an elder in the Presbyterian Church, and tireless. I'm a self-made man. Essentially self-educated, he had boundless energy and a gift for analyzing economic trends. With a strong religious faith, devotion to his family, and a heavy passion for real estate, he was all the more attracted to Minneapolis. Less than 50 years old at the turn of the century, the city's population had grown to 200,000. It was already a bustling center for lumber and wheat. George, convinced that it was time to diversify his bank's rural holdings with some urban real estate, studied the commercial possibilities at Minneapolis. Oh, you said you're going to diversify and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. He sized up the opportunities of the main thoroughfare, standing on various corners of Nicolet Avenue and accounting the passers-by. It was market research at its most basic level, and it led George to selecting what would one day become the most valuable real estate in the city of Minneapolis. But he built 1st and 6th at Nicolet, an office building intended for doctors. Construction had already begun when the Panic of 1893 hit a term given for the serious economic depression of 1893. In Worthington, there was a run on the bank and George Dayton felt compelled to notify his contractors in Minneapolis of his precarious situation. But their faith in George as a man who paid his debts was steadfast. The bank survived, the building at 6th and Nicolet went up. George then turned his attention to 7th, where Westminster Presbyterian Church had once stood. 
The church had burned to the ground, for which reasons remain unknown. But George bought the property for $165,000 and started building. He soon moved to town in 1901 and brought his family in the following year. One thing he refused to leave behind was his roll-top desk from the office. But unlike most of the year behind the table, the news that crossed over was not encouraging. You see, George had bought out the stock of a dry goods company called Goodfellow. He set up two partners in the business with a new building at the corner of 7th at Nicolet. They called it Goodfellow Daylight Store because of all the windows. But unfortunately, the company began to run under losses, causing George to buy it as a whole just to protect his investment. At the age of 45, he got into the retail business. George gave the company his name. Dayton, and the store was doing well. It was a family venture from the start. He and his son came to work in the store after his son graduated from Princeton. Determined to sell dependable merchandise at lowest possible prices, fabrics of all sorts, cushions, gloves and hosiery, shoes, clothing, hats, rugs and draperies. It was a business built on integrity and innovation. Many in the community were skeptical about the prospects of this small town banker and his college educated son. They had a formidable competitor in Donaldson's, whose prestigious glass block store, so called because of its windows, had been in business already 20 years prior. An early innovation was the ad for their inventory sale in June 1903. It got the city talking and generating traffic for a successful sale. Some of the early Dayton policies about advertising would become long-standing traditions. Dayton's never use superlatives and they value favorable word of mouth from customers. More importantly, he believed an advertisement was a reflection of his own high standards of integrity, a promise of honor upon which customers could rely. The store offered to pay $1 to any customer who could find an inaccuracy in a Dayton's ad and as a result, the company's ads were both read and believed. While George communicated with the public through ads, he communicated with employees through store-wide meetings. From a balcony overlooking the first floor, he would share his plans for the business and offer encouragement to employees assembled below. The average salary in those days was $5 for a six-day week. It wasn't unusual to find a personal note from George tucked into an employee pay envelope. The Panic of 1907, or better known as the 1907 Bankers Panic, was another financial crisis that provided another opportunity to win the loyalty of his customers. What's that? Selling out a check. Although the company was advised not to accept checks, ads assured customers that the store would accept checks and issue money orders. Dayton's was able to deposit $25,000 cash in their local bank account to help the bank through the crisis. And as a result, Dayton's had won the gratitude of his customers and the business community. The store started expanding from the original three floors of merchandise to six departments, which had been leased to outside companies, including stationery, dressmaking, china, and glassware, which also included a tea room. The Dayton Dry Goods Company was becoming a true department store. In 1910, it changed its name to Dayton Company. In 1911, George's third son, Nelson, was persuaded to leave the place where he worked and lived, which was a farm, and joined the store. Although agriculture remained his lifelong interest, his focus now was the store and the general farmer proved he could be aggressive. Nelson took over and priced everything at cost for 18 months, long enough to establish the business. He shared his father's and brother's competitive spirit and determination to overtake Donaldson's. But the Daytons also knew how to grow through cooperation. George helped found the Retail Research Association in 1916. In his collaborative group of leading stores across the country, including Hudson's in Detroit, Again, two years later, the Daytons were among the original members of the Associated Merchandising Corporation, or AMC. A disastrous fire in the bitter cold hours of early morning February 17th forced the store to close for the first time in its history. Shops in the Narangan set parcel at a nickel at an eight included Dayton's shoe and silk departments were incinerated. And although the main store was protected by heavy steel doors, the basement was submerged under 11 feet of water. It was 10 days before the store could reopen. 
only to be greeted with a loss of half a million dollars. Still, the Daytons found a way to turn even this setback into an advantage. Their fire sale attracted so many customers that the doors had to be closed to prevent dangerous overcrowding. At Dayton's, it seemed anything and everything had the potential to create publicity and goodwill. Dayton's volume had achieved the goal of surpassing its competitor, Donaldson's. In 1923, George lost his 43-year-old son. He was devastated at the loss of his child and talked of selling the store, but not for long. Nelson Dayton stepped forward to assume his brother's duties. He acted to protect the store from becoming dependent again upon anyone. Nelson set out to build the strongest team of executives in the department store field. Like all family members, he began his career on the selling floor. His cousin George Dayton II had preceded him into business by nine years. The third generation of Daytons would build on that grandfather's grief at the age of 81. Never having officially retired from the store, George Draper Dayton died on February 18, 1938. George was a man of principles and ethics. His personal principles shaped the new store, including his belief in the higher ground of stewardship. It was renamed the Dayton Hudson Foundation in 1969 and later became the Target Foundation in 2000. He believes success is making ourselves useful in the world, being valuable to the society we live in, and helping in lifting the level of humanity so that when we leave, the world will be somewhat better off having lived the brief span of our lives. If you enjoyed this video, consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm, so more people can see our videos and so that you can be notified when we launch our next video. We try and put out at least one new one per week, and as you can imagine, the research and editing alone of these type of videos takes us close to 18 hours. So we would really appreciate it if you could also check out our Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can support our work. We produce over 12 videos per month, so that is literally 8 cents per video. Thank you so much and we'll see you at our next unmasking.